And with that, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and our text will be verses 1 through 6. I'll have you turn there if you're not there already. And once you do, if you're able, I'll ask you to stand. You can follow along as I read. If not, where you're seated is fine. The Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, is very interesting writing. And as he continues now his letter to these Christians there in Thessalonica, and he says, verse 1, You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you His gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal, verse 3, we make, does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. You know, we never use flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We're not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Wow, it's kind of intense a little bit, isn't it? Why don't we pray? We'll ask God to bless this to our understanding. Loving Heavenly Father, Will you at this time just settle our hearts and quiet our minds so we can focus and concentrate on your word and that which you have for us here today in your word? Lord, we're asking you for this, that you would speak into our lives and that we would have ears to hear what the Spirit would say to us as a church. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated. Thank you. I want to talk with you today about our motives, specifically what it is that motivates us the motive of our heart, if you will. I have to begin, though, by admitting to you that today's text is personally, for me, especially as a pastor, first and foremost as a pastor, very searching and convicting as well. And the reason is that Paul is defending himself against what appears to be these false accusations from those who were questioning his motives, the motives of his heart. And these false accusations were like Paul is seeking his own glory. Paul's in it for the money. Paul's deceiving you. Paul's a man pleaser. Paul cannot be trusted. And you can sort of surmise that and conclude that when you read what Paul is writing 
to them. I mean, he has to tell them, I'm, I'm not trying to trick you, as I'm being accused of. I'm not in it for the money, for greed, as I'm being accused of. I'm not in this for myself, or for my own glory, as I'm being accused of. This is one of those places in God's Word where it's important to understand why we even have it in God's Word. I think sometimes it's good that we ask ourselves that question. Why did God deem this important enough to inspire the writer to include it within the pages of Holy Writ? I believe the answer as to why we have this in our Bibles is for those of us, whether in the pulpit or like you in the pew, as it were, to ask ourselves some serious questions in this regard. Questions like, why do I do what I do? In the sense of, what motivates me when it comes to my Christian life and ministry? It's not so much what I do, or even how I do what I do. It really matters why I do it. Why do I do this? There are two such questions that Paul answers concerning what his true motives are. And I think we would do well to ask ourselves the same question. And the first question is in verses 1 through 3, and it's this. Am I motivated by what's in it for me? Is that the motive of my heart? What's in it for me? Many years ago, I heard someone say that everyone is tuned in to WIFM. Have you heard of that station? WIFM, what's in it for me? Everybody has a, those, those four letters written all over them. What's in it for me? And certainly this applies to the pastor, but just so you know, you're not going to get off too easy because misery loves company. And if I'm convicted, I want you to be as convicted as I am. So <laughs> in love, of course. And <laughs> please know that I'm not referring to you. I mean, I think you know how I feel about you and how much I love you as a church. This is an amazing church. But every so often we'll have a visitor come, and the body language is so obvious. It's kind of like this. All right. Bless me. Really? And, and, and you notice it during the worship. Oh, their, their hand, again, I'm not talking about you. I got to be really careful here, don't I? Especially in what direction I look, because then somebody thinks, oh no, he's talking about me. I folded my hands during the worship. I'm not. But instead of hands raised, it's arms folded during the worship. Like, like oh, the worship is supposed to bless you? I, I got news for you. It's not about you. You know that song we sing? I love it. I wish it were true. <laughs> that song that we sing, it's all about you, Jesus. Liar! It's not all about Jesus. It's all about you. You sit yourself down in that pew, and it's this this attitude of, hey, I didn't really like the worship today. Well, that's 
not a problem because the worship wasn't for you today. It was for him. You know, <laughs> when I get up here, as is my privilege to do behind this pulpit every week, I always do so with this attitude. I got to be careful how I phrase this, because I always have to make sure that my attitude's right and the motive of my heart is right as well. And we'll talk more about this in a moment. But I cannot stand up here with this attitude of, you're here for me. Nor should you have this attitude of the opposite direction. I'm here for you. You know, I really only have an audience of one, as it's been said. And you know who that audience of one is. See, at the end of the day, when I make my way back home on a Sunday afternoon, 22 minute drive, Lord and I have a talk during that 22 minutes. And one of the things I always ask of the Lord was, Lord, was that pleasing in your sight? I, I, I don't want to uh, be misunderstood when I say this, but it really doesn't matter what you think about the sermon. It only matters what does God think about the sermon. If God's pleased and you're not, sorry. You know what's sad to me about this text? Is that Paul finds himself forced to defend himself against these false accusations that he was in it for himself. And these accusations were made for the sole purpose of discrediting Paul's character, because if you can discredit Paul's character, then in so doing, you can also discredit his ministry and, as such, the gospel message. You know what I find interesting is whenever I'm on the receiving end of a false accusation, the accuser is usually guilty of that which they're falsely accusing me of. It's believed that the Jews were stirring things up, and they were leveling these false accusations against Paul in opposition to Paul. And so Paul has to defend himself. You know, there are times when we would do well to let God defend us, but then there are other times when it's really important that we offer a defense of the gospel. And that's usually the litmus test. This isn't Paul personally defending himself. He's defending the gospel, the message, because he knows what's at stake here. So he's arguing his defense by presenting the evidence, if you will. And his evidence, Exhibit A, is his suffering. That's his evidence. In other words, were he in it for what he could gain from it, he certainly wouldn't stay in it if it meant suffering because of it. Do you see that? Here's Paul now on the receiving end of these incredible false accusations that he's in it for the money. And here's Paul going, are you kidding me? I'm in this for myself. Oh yeah, I signed up for this. I'm, I'm standing in line for suffering and shipwrecks and beating, imprisonment. The list goes on and on. Listen, <laughs> let me just, ah, sometimes I have to, we're in the Proverbs on Thursday night, for those of you who know and have been joining us. I'm telling you, it's what a great study. And uh, one of the things, this recurring theme in the book of Proverbs is 
you better be careful with your mouth and what you say. And, and you know, with many words, transgression is unavoidable. <laughs> that proverb was written for me. <laughs> I mean, the more you say, the more, you know, potential there is for saying something wrong. So I need to really think this through before I say it. Personally, I did not get into the ministry because I wanted to be popular or have friends or make more money. <laughs> In fact, it's the exact opposite that's true. And the audacity of these false accusers to levy these false accusations against Paul. And it's like Paul's going, I mean, do you think that I'm in the ministry doing all that I'm doing because I stand to gain? <laughs> Have you looked at my life? Would you like to see my resume? It's pretty impressive, you know, not in the way you might think. Of all people, Paul wasn't concerned for himself. His only concern was for the gospel of Jesus Christ and the church of Jesus Christ. And he was ferociously protective of this church in particular. Well, this brings us to the second question of verses 4 through 6, and sort of ties in to the first one. But here's the question. Am I motivated by being a man pleaser? It should be noted that no less than two times in these six verses, Paul makes it clear in no uncertain terms that he's not looking to please people, nor is he looking for the praise of people. Now, let me hasten to say that this in no way meant that Paul didn't care for people. The opposite is true. And for those of you that read ahead to stay ahead, you know what's ahead. I mean, in the verses that follow, talk about a pastor being convicted. I mean, I have to ask myself, do I love you the way Paul loved them? That's what he's going to talk about in the verses that follow. There's actually another question that this brings up, and it has to do with the disparity or discrepancy, if you prefer, in the church today. Let me explain this. And actually, we talked about this on Thursday night in our Proverbs study, but To me, when I think about where the church, and I'm speaking in broad terms, the church in general, the church as a whole, particularly in America today, I think about the church today compared with the early church in Paul's day. And I have to tell you that there's quite a disparity, discrepancy again. And it's almost like we've come so far as a church, again, speaking in general terms, from what the church was in the beginning. You know, I I just have to, again, be very candid and open with you, but this really convicts me. Because when I compare the church in that day to the church of today, I see superstar pastors. I see mega churches. Nothing wrong when God adds daily to the numbers and grows the church as only he can.
But it's, it's, it's almost like it's not about Jesus anymore. And I think we need look no further than to that seventh letter to that seventh church in the book of Revelation chapter 3. The church of Laodicea. I mean, this is a church that Jesus isn't even in anymore. This is a church that he's knocking on the door saying, can I come in, back in, and sup with you and you with me? This, this, this is a, the lukewarm church that Jesus said, you, you make me sick. You, I wish you were either hot or cold. I, 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 you just make me so sick. I want to vomit you out of my mouth. When measured up against the plumb line of God's righteousness, What do you mean by plumb line? Well, a plumb line is a weight that is suspended from a string that's used as a vertical reference to ensure that a structure that is built is straight and centered. That's the measuring, that's the gauge, that's the plumb line, up against which everything is measured. We see this plumb line of God in Scripture as the measurement of righteousness related to every aspect of our Christian lives, and certainly every aspect of the Christian church. Listen to what Isaiah said, chapter 28, verse 17. I will make justice the measuring line, and righteousness the plumb line. And when he does, not good. Hail will sweep away your refuge, the lie, and water will overflow your hiding place. In other words, God takes His perfect standard of righteousness, this, this plumb line of righteousness, and here's my life, your life. Here's the church, the ministry, and it's measured up against that plumb line. And it's like this. Whoa! like this. The disparity, the discrepancy, it doesn't line up. The prophet Amos says in chapter 7, verse 7, this is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. I have a book in my library written by a man by the name of Stanley Volk. He's now with the Lord. I had the privilege, actually, many, many years ago, back in the early 90s, of meeting him. He was one of the speakers at a conference that I was attending. And he's written many books, but this one in particular is a treasured classic in my library. And I read it often. I read it again recently, and it's titled Personal Revival. And he writes about this plumb line. Listen to what he had to say. We see God standing on the wall of our life, looking upon every part of it. As he holds the plumb line against us, it becomes obvious where things are not quite straight. Every part of life is touched. For instance, 
When the plumb line goes deeper into our motives, it tests whether we do everything for the glory of the Lord or to please men. So God searches us with His plumb line, not to drive us into judgment or despair, but to draw us sweetly to repentance, that in His arms we might find forgiveness and the fullness of His love. And then He says this, I love this, He wants us not to hide from Him, but in Him, in Christ's righteousness. So stay with me. Here's here's what it looks like. (laughs) Here's God's plumb line. And then we bring everything that we do, our Christian lives, our Christian ministry, our service to the Lord, everything we do, and we put it up against that plumb line, and we say, oh wow, that's way off. (laughs) That's really way off. That area is really, here's, here's the plumb line. And and here's my life that the plumb line is the measurement of. And it's way out of whack, if I can say it that way. So what's my response? Condemnation? Absolutely not. Conviction? Absolutely yes. And this is what I mean by, and when you teach the Bible expositionally, book by book and chapter by chapter and verse by verse, you can't get away with skipping over this. Could you imagine? I show up here one Sunday and a text of this nature, and I say, by the way, we're going to skip the first six verses of First Thessalonians chapter 2, because it's like way too convicting. I mean, when the plumb line of God's measurement and righteousness is here, and the church is here, and my marriage is here, and my ministry is here, and my service is there, and I need to straighten up. Maybe I need to wake up. And it's not because God says, I'm God, and I said so. (laughs) It's God saying, listen, uh, it's for your own good. You're a people pleaser. You'll be the most miserable people pleaser on the planet, because you're never going to please people. You've heard that saying, right? When my eyes are on others, I'm distressed. When my eyes are on myself, I'm depressed. But when my eyes are on Jesus, I'm blessed. It's very dorky, I realize, but it's very true, isn't it? God desires our best, and that we are so blessed. And He says, here's the plumb line. And to the degree in which you are in line with my plumb line, you will be blessed. And the further away from it you go or are, it's to your own peril. Would this sound like a firm grasp of the obvious if I were to say to you that God wants your marriage to be blessed? I mean, I know that sounds like a firm grasp of the obvious, right? He has your best interests at heart. And quite frankly, he has to, because marriage is a microcosm of the eternal picture because it portrays and pictures and points to our marriage as the bride of Jesus Christ to our bridegroom, Jesus Christ. That's why, by the way, Satan hates marriage so much. And this is not a teaching on marriage. That's another topic for another time. But that's why the enemy hates your Christian marriage, because of what your Christian marriage represents. 
not just the Christian marriage, he hates the Christian church. And he'll do everything he can to get his foot in that door of that church. He'll join that church. He'll become a member of that church. (laughs) That might sound far-fetched, but that's how he does it. Very subtly. And he gets that church, that marriage, that Christian, as far away from that plumb line as he possibly can. And look at the fruit of it today. I pray in closing that we would allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts, the motives of our hearts, and see if it be in line with God's plumb line of righteousness. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Tough stuff, but good. A hard word, but it's your word. I think of the disciples after that hard teaching about your body and your blood and how the multitudes just I mean, they bailed. And then Peter asks you, or you ask Peter, are are you going to bail on me too? And and Peter's response is, where are we going to go? You alone. It's a hard word, but you alone have the word of truth. This is truth. Lord, thank you for your word of truth. I pray that we'll have the needed impact on our lives as your people and on the life of this church as your church, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.